had my walking problems for three years. I also had slight urinary incontinence. I've had memory problems because I'm getting older. I'm 77 years old and I think it's age-related also. Elizabeth was eventually referred to Dr. Mike Williams, a board-certified neurologist. Her main complaint was trouble with her walking and with falling. Um, and even though she and her husband had said for many years she'd always had a little bit of a habit of tripping or falling, this was getting worse. Something was definitely changing. She'd hurt herself as a result of the falls. After running a series of tests, she was diagnosed with normal pressure hydrocephalus, or NPH. So what is NPH? Within the brain, the entire surface of our central nervous system is bathed in a clear colorless fluid called cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. The CSF is contained within a network of fluid-filled cavities called ventricles. The CSF and ventricles serve to protect the brain from trauma, transport harmful waste away from the brain, help in providing suspension for the brain, as well as to transport hormones to different areas of the brain. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, or NPH, is caused by an accumulation of CSF that results in these ventricles becoming enlarged with little or no increase in ventricular pressure. NPH typically occurs in people over 50. It is a syndrome that's seen most commonly in older persons. And the symptoms, dementia, trouble with walking and balance, trouble with bladder control are the three most common problems of the elderly. It's only very rarely that hydrocephalus explains all of that. So a lot of the neurologist's job is to figure out, is it a little of this, a little of that, or is it explained by hydrocephalus? So if we think about dementia uh, as an example, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. If a doctor or neurologist suspects a patient may have NPH, there are several methods that can help determine a diagnosis. If a diagnosis of NPH is made, then there's a treatment called shunting that in some cases can significantly improve a patient's symptoms. Shunting involves placing a ventricular catheter in the brain to transport excess cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricles to another part of the body, such as the abdominal cavity or right atrium, where the fluid can be absorbed back into the bloodstream. A shunt or valve is attached to the catheter to regulate the amount of fluid drained from the ventricles. If the procedure is successful, patients will notice an improvement and sometimes a complete reversal of symptoms. In the past, the success rates for shunting varied dramatically, and the reasons were unknown. Many patients experienced no change in their symptoms, and some experienced some success only to see a return of symptoms at a later date. One problem was that once the shunt was in place and the procedure was finished, there was no way for the valve to change its flow setting to determine how much fluid was actually being carried away from the ventricle. If enough fluid wasn't being carried away, then the accumulation in the ventricle persisted. Or if too much fluid was carried away, then other complications could develop. Recent improvements in shunt technology, as well as more sophisticated diagnostic methods, are showing hope for improving the success rates in shunting. In the old days, which was not so long ago, uh, shunts would have a valve that opened or closed at a particular pressure. And you had to make your best guess as to which pressure a patient needed. And if you were right, everything was fine. But if you were wrong, the only way to change it was another operation to remove the old valve and put in a new one. Now, that's not a big operation, but it is an operation. The adjustable shunts have a valve that is in essence like a tiny faucet or a tiny dial that you can adjust with a magnetic mechanism. And if a patient comes in after their shunt surgery and says to me, I'm better, but I'm not as good as I was expecting to be based on the spinal fluid drainage, then we can say, well, let's lower the pressure setting of the shunt, which will allow a little bit more spinal fluid to flow through it and see how you do over the next several months. This valve has five different flow performance settings that can be adjusted post-operatively so that the correct amount of CSF can be drained from the ventricles. These adjustments are made with a non-invasive hand tool that works by using magnetic coupling. The ability of adjusting the valve according to the patient need obviously obviates for the need of a new surgery. And that is, again, major 
improvement because, again, you may eliminate the need of unnecessary surgery in that way. It gives us a lot more flexibility than we had a decade ago, and I think it really allows us to not only get patients better, but to fine-tune their response to the shunt and the hydrocephalus. For patients like Elizabeth and others like her, this technology is giving them a renewed opportunity to enjoy their golden years. I think that uh, as a doctor, it is very nice to realize that what you do has a beneficial effect on the people that come to you for help.